Good morning. I'm Tracy Roosevelt. I'm an associate at Foley HOAG here in Washington and a co-chair of WILLIG, as Wes said. Um, I also teach a course on international arbitration and litigation at Northeastern Law School. Um, this morning, we are so fortunate to have a distinguished panel of participants from many different roles in international arbitrations. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank both ASIL and our co-sponsors, co the DC Women in Arbitration and the Georgetown Law International Arbitration Society. Thank you for your help setting this up. Women have been found in dramatically low numbers on the benches and panels in international arbitration. And it's those earlier experiences on which they depend to get to those positions. That's our topic today. I'm gonna take a moment to just say the name uh, and role of each of our participants. And you have in front of you bios um, that give you more information. If anyone still needs a bio uh, sheet, please let me know. Uh, the panelists will then speak for a few moments to tell you a little bit about their initial uh, thoughts on women in arbitration. After that, I'll ask some questions, but our hope is that this will be a forum for discussion. And so if you see something you wanna follow up on right away, please feel free to jump in. Otherwise, I'll leave about a half an hour for questions at the end. At the end of the panel here is Gonzalo Flores, a, secretary, a Deputy Secretary General at ICSID. Next to him, we have Claudia Frutos Peterson, a partner at Curtis Malay, and she also teaches international arbitration at American University Washington College of Law. Next to her, we have Gabrielle Kaufman Kohler. She is a partner in Levy Kaufman Kohler, and she is professor of law and director of the LLM in dispute settlement at the University of Geneva. Next to her, we have Tara Gearhart Serna. She's an attorney advisor in L, the, um, the State Department's Office of the Legal Advisor. And next to her, we have Anne-Marie Whitesell, who is a professor of law and director of the LLM in dispute settlement at Georgetown University Law Center. So without any uh, further ado, we will start with Gonzalo, if you want to make some, some brief remarks. Uh, thank you, Tracy. Thank you very much. Is this work? Can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, thanks, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Thanks for inviting me. I have to say that I'm, I'm delighted and I am terrified uh, to be here. When I was invited a few days ago, or some days ago, I first thing I thought is, uh, what are my qualifications to be here? Why, why do I qualify to speak about women in, in, any, in any capacity? So uh, basically, for those who know me, I have, uh, I have been with ICSID for 20 years now. I'm the Deputy Secretary General. I've been privileged to work with the best people in the world, female and male. So I have seen the evolution of the role of women in, in our field. And it's very different today than it was in 1998. Also, I'm extremely fortunate to have been having a 25-year conversation now with my wife, who's a feminist legal scholar. She's been training, training me well, uh, sensitizing me to a number of things, I think. Uh, I have a son and a daughter, so equal treatment of people is personal concern <laughs> to me. And also, being a, ma a male, I have an excessive and totally unfounded confidence on my own qualifications, so <laughs> here I am. So two or three brief points that I was discussing with the scholar in residence in my house about what's important about her. Uh, equal treatment of people in general. And a few points that came to my mind thinking about this, this panel was, first of all, is the issue of visibility. This panel would have not existed 20 years ago. This was not a topic of discussion. The fact that this is being mainstreamed is very important. Uh, hopefully in 20 more years, we're not gonna be having these panels. It's gonna be just a fact of life. Another point that I think is important is that uh, women in arbitration, women in general is important. Um, it's important for the development of the legal professional. It's important uh, because diversity leads to better decisions. But we have to be careful not to limit the discussion to women in arbitration. There are intersectional preferences that have to be considered. And if we don't want to go from a full wild European male system to a full European uh, white system. 
So mm -hmm. there are other factors to be taken into consideration aside from the participation of male and female. Having said that, a little bit of context of ICSID. Um, as you know, ICSID is the, the predominant uh, dispute settlement mechanism for investment arbitration in the world. We have handled more than 70% of the cases in the world. Um, all, the large majority of our cases are decided by three panel members, uh, three panel tribunals that are usually comprised by one arbitrator appointed by each party and one, uh, one president who is usually uh, selected by agreement of the parties and occasionally is uh, selected by, our, by ICSID when the parties cannot agree. Now, um, uh, when we have to make an appointment by default in the absence of agreement of the parties, we need to pick the president uh, or the missing arbitrators from a, li from a list, a list of arbitrators that is composed of appointments made by state members. We have today 153 state members, and each state appoints up to four members to the panels. And it's from those panels that, in principle, unless there's an agreement of the parties, that we, we, we have to make appointments. Also, we make all the appointments in case of annulments, which is the review level in, in investment in exit investment arbitration. As a consequence of that, and contrary to what many people think, 75% uh, of the appointments are made by the parties. It's only 25% of the appointments that are made by us. Uh, and it's mostly annulment committees. Now, I was looking at some interesting numbers. Uh, a couple of years ago, my Secretary General, McKinnier, by the way, exit has had two secretary, female secretary generals on a row, the la last two, uh, Meg being one of the most uh, notorious and successful secretary generals in the 52 years of the institution. And she was mentioning that uh, two, only two years ago that there, have, there were 60 females appointed to the exit panel of arbitrators. We've been having a very strong push for states to make appointments, to fill those, those, those panels. And today we have uh, 124 women in the panel of arbitrators. Out of a total of 678, but still it's roughly 18-19% uh, of the appointees by the states are females. And in this regard, it's uh, quite interesting to note uh, Secretary General McKinney and myself were uh, giving a series of workshops in Bahamas a couple of years ago. And first of all, we, we met up with a lot of authorities in, in Bahamas, not one single man. Uh, at the Governor General, the Attorney General, the Minister of Infrastructure, all very powerful female quite intimidating. The only powerful guy in the whole tour was our security, <laughs> chief of security. <laughs> he was physically powerful, but no decision making. And Bahamas is notable because the four panel members of Bahamas in the exit list, they're all women. So, and that, that's the only country who has done that. Uh, on the other hand, we usually have to make appointments, as I said, of presidents and annulment committee members. And there's always the element of experience which kicks in. So while we take into consideration diversity, experience, and, and knowledge of the, this particular field are constraints to our, to our appointments. Um, what have we done in the last few years? Uh, as you, some of you may know, we have uh, taken a number of initiatives. First of all, we, uh, we have a very strong uh, transparency policy and publication program. So you can see all of our appointments on the website that leads to accountability. Who are we appointment? Where are they from? Gender uh, uh, distinctions, etc. A few years ago, to encourage, and, and we just briefly chat about this with Gabriel about party appointments, we started to a new process of, uh, we call the ballot, where we offered uh, a list of possible presidents to parties where they only have to say yes or no without indication of why, make it, and, it, and they don't need, the parties don't need to copy each other, they only send us their response to us. Uh, and in this ballot, we have made a rule of including, at the very least, one female candidate every time. Uh, at the beginning, the ballot wasn't very successful. We had a 6% six rate, six rate of success. And this has been increasing. I think we're close to a 30% of success. And this has been very good because it puts new names, different names before the parties, names that the parties usually would not think about it. Uh, recently, the chairman's list, the president of the World Bank, also has a list of arbitrators and conciliators with the World Bank. 
which uh, comprises 10 individuals from different regions of the world. For the first time in 52 years, our chairman's list is uh, composed of five uh, females and five males. It's 50-50, the list of conciliators and the list of arbitrators, which we, we think it's, it's a big advance. Um, you, you need to look at the, and I'm gonna just gonna finish very quickly. You can look at this as a snapshot, or as I'm being very lucky, you can look at this as a process. Uh, if you look, out, looking back, the first 20 years of Fixit, there were absolutely no female appointments. Um, uh, the first appointments of women were in, back in 1987, three appointments, and only one president, who was Ross Higgins, in the second AMCO case. Um, I joined Ixit in 1998, and I left in 2001 to come back a few months later, uh, with great regret of having left. In those three years where I first was with ICSID, there were, we constituted 30 tribunals. That is 90 appointments. Four women were appointed in those three years. And of these, uh, and three of them were in, in 2001. One was uh, Gabriel kaufman Kohler, Caroline Lam, and Brigitte Stern, all very well-known names today. But three in three years, four in three years, it's, it's nothing. Today, um, again, looking at the, looking at the, the, the whole history, 9% of all appointments only have been female. But last, ye last calendar year, 20% of the appointments were, were women. And in, if you look at the half, uh, last half year, 22% of the women of the appointments were female. So the number is, is, is increasing. Again, if you take a picture today, say, oh, it's a very low number. If you compare it with 20 years ago, it's a, it's a, it's a very consistent increase, which only reflects a reality that you're seeing in cases, because it's not only arbitrators. Arbitrators and presiding arbitrators, it's a huge gap. But we're seeing lead counsel, uh, heads of practices in different international law firms being female. So the presence of female is, uh, is, is uh, growing. On, from a purely anecdotal point of view, when I was in law school, my wife always pointed to the fact that though we were 50-50 number of students, this is a very old law school, there were three bathrooms for men and only one bathroom for women. <laughs> this, this is not the way today. So in closing, uh, all I'm saying is that we, we, we see a vast improvement in, in the fair share of appointments. Uh, I think that the name, the numbers are changing, and it is it is slow. But I think we're on the right direction. And again, I like to see it as a process, not as a snapshot. And I hope not to be discussing this in 20 years from now. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo. Well, in two more years. Or two more years. <laughs> well, whenever my daughter graduates from law school. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go to Claudia next. Okay. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, I just, uh, before I start with uh, a very short introduction, I, uh, I just want to tell you why. I do know why Gonzalo is here. Uh, Gonzalo did not say it, but uh, really uh, among uh, uh, male uh, members of the arbitration community, I, I really think that uh, uh, Gonzalo has been doing a terrific work in, uh, in supporting all uh, women in arbitration. Uh, all the crazy ideas that we had. I mean, I used to work with Gonzalo for almost nine years, and uh, and I I always uh, knew that I had a sponsor with Gonzalo, and, and and that's why he's here today with us. He was terrified. He told me, no, what I, you know, I don't want to go and discuss these issues with all these ladies in the room. And I say no, precisely because you know we talk about. The, uh, to diversify, you know, because we want people to understand how important this issue is. I mean, we need sponsors like you, you know, to go ahead and, and, and help us uh, with this initiative. Um, uh, in my, uh, um, so thank you, Gonzalo. In my, in my very short remark that I want to make, uh, uh, because I think we will have a, a moment for questions and answers, and, and Tracy has also prepared a few questions. I, I, I just want to take my, 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 uh, uh, three minutes, two minutes introduction, uh, you know, to talk a little bit about an initiative that now has been uh, going around for a few years now. Uh, so is, uh, is the pledge, the equal representation uh, in arbitration for women. 
I have here the proof. <laughs> and we have more information about the pledge downstairs. Uh, so please uh, don't be shy and, uh, and check it out. I, I have to admit that I was a little bit shy when I heard about the pledge at the beginning. Um, I wasn't really sure uh, if it was a good idea, you know, because I have always been uh, someone who believes that um, um, I don't like the quotas, I don't like uh, just to put a female uh, lawyer in a panel just because we need a lady in the panel and we want to send the message that uh, uh, we are, uh, you know, we're all equal here and we're trying to do diversify. Um, uh, 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 and, and I have my issues with that thought, uh, but I had the opportunity to learn more about the pledge in the ICC uh, Miami conference uh, last year. And I was uh, very, very impressed, you know, with, all, with the initiative globally and uh, with all the work, the hard work that some of our colleagues uh, in, in the community have been doing, this is something that I think some of our uh, female lawyers at Freshfields had started, and now it really has partic participation for a lot of people around the world. And, uh, I, and I really think that it's important that you look at it carefully. This year, there is this beautiful advertisement about the New Year's goals, uh, you know, with the 10 pledge resolutions. And, uh, and when you look at them, uh, they're very simple uh, statements, honestly. Uh, but those are the kind of statements that we need to keep in our minds to really try to put forward this initiative and to really try to uh, make the point that, as Gonzalo said, uh, things have changed. And, uh, and they need to continue changing. Uh, so, and, uh, and I'm also talking about the pledge because I, I, I was so happy about uh, the initiative when I finally understood it that uh, they made me the DC representative <laughs> for the <laughs> pledge <laughs> together with Gonzalo. Uh, so we are the two DC representatives. So if you have any questions, please come and talk to us. Uh, but the idea here is honestly uh, to try to uh, make equal representation about women in arbitration. It's a very serious proposal uh, in the sense that we need to think about these issues and we need to promote them. Uh, it's not, the idea is not, as I said, to have women just because we need women and we need to complete those quotas, but it's more because there are a lot of competent women out there and, uh, and they need to be part of the community. They need to be part of the community uh, as arbitrators. Uh, and this has been a big change, I agree with Gonzalo. The process now is moving into that direction. Let's keep pushing. Uh, but we also need, uh, uh, you know, equal representation uh, about women uh, in the <coughs> expert world. Uh, you know, so experts participating in arbitration cases, uh, they still have a tendency to be male experts. Uh, and I have met terrific female experts, um, uh, you know, and they have done wonderful jobs in front of uh, very, very competent tribunals. And, uh, and I think uh, it's, a, it's a global effort, you know, it's an effort to have, uh, to have um, in different kind of uh, categories, kind of uh, works, uh, in the field of arbitration to have all those ladies who have the ability to do and contribute uh, mm, you know to international arbitration to international law uh, you know to um, to work together to to achieve that um, so uh, I think um, uh, the the idea to have something like the pledge and it's not the only initiative out there but the idea that to have something like that has really helped uh, to put in our minds that it is time to de develop this kind of initiatives. Uh, I also, as Tracy was saying, I also work at the American University Washington College of Law. I'm a professor there. Uh, thank you for some of the students that they came this morning. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think it's important to also have uh, not only the institutions involved, but also the universities. <laughs> and I think Gabriel will talk more about that. Uh, but, um, uh, but uh, uh, you know, it is important that the faculty of law also uh, push this kind of initiatives and, and works together, together with everybody, not only women, but also males. Uh, I was just telling my colleagues that we started classes on Monday, and uh, I walk into the room, and, uh, and I only had eight male students, you know, not a single woman. Uh, of course, I got a little bit disappointed, so I sent an email immediately to say, where is the, the female power here? But, uh, but uh, you know, but this is the kind of thing that we need to continue working on. Um, I, I, I don't want to talk about my personal 
uh, you know, story here right now. Maybe I can contribute with some of the question and answers. But I, 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 want, I really wanted to take time, you know, to share with you about this initiative. And hopefully, uh, you know, if you have any questions, we will be happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. And I just wanted to add that both Claudia and Gabrielle are actively preparing for hearings at the moment. So it's especially <laughs> nice that they took time out of that intensive time to be with us. And Gabrielle is on her way uh, to New York for one tomorrow. So next we'll have Gabrielle, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. It's always a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, I have just gathered a few thoughts about uh, gender diversity and, and they're not necessarily organized and I know there will be questions <coughs> later on so let me just uh, mention these thoughts quite briefly. First of all, why does gender diversity matter? It's obvious probably to everyone that is a question of fairness, of justice when half of the world population is female. Uh, but beyond that, in international arbitration, uh, there's been some research uh, in more for the judiciary and more for national judiciaries that tries to understand whether a, a diverse body makes better decisions than a homogeneous one. Um, it would make sense to us at least to say that if you have a diverse body, you would take into account diverse viewpoints and therefore make more informed decisions. Will they be better in arbitration so far? We have no empirical evidence of that, and I'm not sure. And I've asked myself, how, uh, just on the basis of my experience, whether uh, the deliberations were different if I had another woman on the tribunal. Of course, I don't know how it is when this woman is male, <laughs> because I've never, I'm never there. So, uh, so my, my perspective is, of course, restricted to just having one other uh, woman and two uh, um, or two male colleagues. And I, I really don't see the difference. So I'm, I'm not certain uh, that uh, you can uh, justify gender diversity was, was this, at least we have no evidence so far. But more, much more importantly, gender diversity is important because of the legitimacy of the process. And we uh, all know how uh, criticized uh, arbitration is uh, nowadays, at, this, at least in this part of the world, meaning Amer uh, North America uh, uh, and Europe. And that goes uh, to investment arbitration, of course, particularly, but it also spills over to, uh, to commercial arbitration. And that is certainly one reason why uh, a, a, a body that makes uh, decisions should reflect uh, those to whom the decision, uh, uh, to which the decision will apply. And looking at the population, obviously, uh, that uh, makes sense. So to enhance uh, legitimacy of the process, we should certainly work on diversity. Then I've asked myself, then, then there's one thing, and I think uh, Gonzalo mentioned it already, uh, that is important to me, is uh, we speak here of gender diversity, and that is fine, of course. But there are much bigger <coughs> challenges in terms of diversity coming. Uh, with respect to regional diversity, representation of low-income countries, for, especially in investment arbitration, and that is a more difficult challenge. So far, arbitration, at least the arbitrator's pool, is, uh, is Western world uh, people, right? And so that, that needs to be changed as the economic power is shifting towards the East, as many disputes will come out of Africa, uh, we need to be aware of that. Third point is, is I've asked myself about the, the evolution in recent years, and Gonzalo has already spoken about the increase of, of the number of women, and, and, and Claudia has also uh, mentioned the pledge that is certainly an excellent initiative and is, is very much uh, 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 an illustration of the fact that the awareness has risen a lot. It was completely different uh, 20 years ago. I had my first arbitration in 1981. It was very different. I felt like, uh, like Gonzalo today. <laughs> <laughs> it was always the alibi woman. <laughs> yeah, not the alibi woman. I'm just kidding. No, and uh, it was funny to hear about the bathroom test. I have the same test. Uh, the ladies' room uh, during breaks. <laughs> 
yeah. in hearings. It's just anecdotal, but it says a lot. I was always alone going to the ladies' <laughs> room, and, and the, the men's room was crowded. And now it's more uh, balanced. It's more balanced. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just that's not really a scientific measure. <laughs> uh, diversity. Uh, in addition to uh, the uh, stronger awareness, there's also a, a very solid uh, body of research now on the composition of the arbitrator's pool. That didn't exist 10 years ago, and that is very helpful. It means that we're not just uh, trying to guess according to our uh, observations and intuitions, uh, but we, we have a very uh, scientific basis to assess uh, the composition of the, of the arbitrator's pool. There's a clear effort by the institutions that is being made to uh, increase diversity. Uh, that is obvious, and, and Gonzalo has shown it was, was figures in the fact that the chairman's list of exit is, has now parity is, is maybe more symbolic than anything else, but symbols uh, uh, matter. So that, that is good. Um, on the other hand, appointments by parties in council, and they're 25% of the, uh, they're 75% of the appointments, so that they're, 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 they're a huge part. They're not, not diverse at all. Or, or the increase is, is, is really uh, marginal. And that is something uh, on which uh, we have to work. Now, of course, you can count <coughs> on good intentions and think that people are reasonable and they understand that they m must promote diversity. Uh, it's quite slow, I must say, uh, in that respect. And uh, so I have asked and I said what, what to do, and that's my first, uh, my fourth and last point, and, and that uh, just two points, and then we can discuss this in, in more detail afterwards, and there, there's many things that can be done. Uh, I've looked at uh, the experience of international courts and tribunals uh, doing research on, on the reform of uh, investor state arbitration. And there I was struck that the di gender diversity uh, proportion is, is better than arbitration, certainly much better than party appointments, but better in, uh, in general. ICJ 20%, WTO appellate body 14, that's not very good. Uh, Court of Justice of the EU, 18, European Court of Human Rights, 33% of women, and the International Criminal Court, 39%. Oh. So quite high numbers. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> the study that uh, on which I rely uh, also showed that courts that have specific representativeness requirements are doing better. They can be aspirational or, or they can be mandatory, it doesn't matter, but they, they do better in terms of diversity. And uh, those that have uh, these requirements or, or targets or aspirational language have 15% women average. Uh, no, those that do not have them have 15% women average, and those do have them have 33%. So what do I draw from this with respect to arbitration? First of all, targets, or sometimes called quota, uh, do make a difference. And we need to discuss whether we can, uh, we can import this into arbitration or not. States make appointments, uh, or there's the screening bodies that they take, uh, selection bodies that they put in place. Uh, in a manner that can much more easily enforce pro-diversity policies than we can in the arbitration system. And so uh, that, to me, raises the question, again, it's been raised uh, years ago by Jan Paulson about the legitimacy of the party appointment of arbitrators should we get rid of the and have just the institution make the make the appointment? The the proposal wasn't was not very popular, may not be popular today, but we need to think about it. And it was not made for purposes of diversity; mm -hmm. it was made for purposes of impartiality more. But uh, it would have certainly a, a, a significant influence on uh, the arbitrator pool and then and that also of course is linked to uh, to 
uh, the uh, representation of women mm -hmm. in other mm -hmm. uh, uh, activities like mm -hmm. council, where we also see an increase, but uh, maybe uh, slow mm -hmm. as well. Uh, the fact that you have caught our targets uh, may be unpleasant, and I have long been against it, saying, you know, I, I, I want to be good. I want to be chosen because I'm good. I don't want to be chosen because they have to take a woman. But at the same time, maybe, <laughs> maybe now we need a push. <laughs> we have been uh, doing this the, the best we could, but maybe it would help because uh, acting, for instance, as a pointing authority, which I sometimes do for the PCA, I now put, put lists together, like uh, Gonzalo explained, and I really look for women. Usual, ten years ago, I would have taken the, the usual suspects. They were all male and thought that was a good list. Now, I don't do this anymore. Now, I look for names of women. They may not be by now as well known as a number of uh, senior figures uh, that are uh, men. But I do find very good names once I try, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, the targets do uh, force to try. That's all I have to say. <coughs> Thank you. Tara. Good morning. Um, and Tracy, thank you for, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with this distinguished group. Um, so since I am uh, the one person in active service in government here, I will start with your standard disclaimer um, that I'm here in my personal capacity and um, no views I express are necessarily the views of the US government. Um, so I, uh, I am currently in L, the Office of the Legal Advisor at the State Department, and specifically I'm in the Office of International Claims and Investment Disputes. So we are the office that represents the United States in um, investor state disputes, whether they are cases where the United States is the respondent or they are cases under treaties to which we're a party and where we might express views on treaty interpretation as a, a non-disputing party. Um, but before my, my current life as a government lawyer, I was in private practice for about four and a half years in New York um, at Debevoise doing investment arbitration. So I've had um, kind of the perspective of being in the private sector and doing primarily claimant side work and now being government lawyer representing the government side. Um, and so I wanted to talk just a little bit about kind of my own um, experience uh, as a woman in both of those roles. Um, so starting out in, in private practice, you know, I think I was really quite lucky in that I uh, was in a practice group that had quite a lot of, uh, of women. Um, I generally was working with female senior associates. There was a woman partner um, elevated to the practice group when I was a summer associate, another one I was an associate, and another since I've left. Um, so I always had a sense that there was actually quite a lot of um, women, and it wasn't entirely male-dominated in terms of the practice group. But um, thinking back on this um, in, in preparing for the panel, I realized that I don't think I ever had a female client, I never had a female witness, and I never <laughs> appeared before a female arbitrator. So, <laughs> um, in fact, the only, the only time I did, I was indirectly involved in a kind of a sister arbitration to something I was working on that was before Gabrielle. So I was once in one of Gabrielle's hearing rooms, that was my, the only time. Um, so I think this really maybe emphasizes that even as firms, um, you know, and council work on becoming more diverse and appointing more women partners, you know, there is a, a point at which arbitration, because it has this sort of party autonomy element and is party driven, if you have, um, you know, users who are entirely male dominated, it can be extremely hard to sort of break those barriers, both in terms of arbitrators, but I think, you know, Claudia makes a very good point in terms of experts as well. Um, actually, I can only remember even experts on the other side, you know, who were being cross-examined. I can only remember one woman in all of the hearings that I that I ever did. One woman expert witness. Um, and now, so so it's a it's a bit of a mixed bag. I think I had a very good experience in terms of the women that I worked with. It was a very supportive environment, but um, definitely thinking back and remembering days when. Uh, you know, I was in strategy meetings with counsel and clients and, you know, experts, and I can remember meetings where there were 11 men and then me, um, uh, sort of holding, holding up the, the flag uh, by myself. And uh, so one nice thing that, one nice experience I've sort of had coming into government is um, thinking about where I am now, the chief of investment arbitration um, in the office where I work, who oversees all of our investment arbitration work, um, is a woman. 
the assistant legal advisor of the Office of International Claims and Investment Disputes is a woman. Um, I checked and we have exact parity, I believe, among the assistant legal advisors of all the different offices. I think it's 50-50 men and women, 50-50 among the deputy legal advisors. And as of this week, um, we have a woman legal advisor. Um, so one sort of nice thing in government is I, I think the government is perhaps doing a good job or a better job than the private sector in some ways in terms of having women lawyers. I'm sure there are ways to go on other measures of diversity. Um, but in terms of women um, being present and having some sort of parity, uh, I look around my office and we're doing pretty well. And I have, for the first time, it turns out, looking back, I have women clients, um, which has been something I didn't realize that I didn't have until I had them. <laughs> um, and, uh, and one other kind of interesting thing for me has just been, you know, if you're in government and you are representing your country, no one can really necessarily sort of put you to the side or kind of discount what you're saying. If you're sitting somewhere and you have the United States of America placard in front of you, you sort of have to be to be dealt with um, no matter who you are. So um, I think that has been one thing um, that's really struck me now that now that I have now that I have women clients clients now that I'm in that kind of environment looking back and realizing it's amazing how much you don't even notice even when you are a woman how male dominated the field you're in is. So to me, what that says is, you know, the pledge and some of these efforts that Gonzalo was talking about, one thing that's important about them, you know, I think as Gabrielle just said, is that symbols have value, um, talking about things has value, and one of the most important things that I'm seeing is just people talking about the fact that you look around and there are way less women than there are men, and the fact that you're now thinking about it when you're thinking about who you're going to appoint or who you're going to agree to as a chair of a panel, and you look at a list and it even occurs to you, there's no women on this, we need to, you know, aren't there, aren't there qualified women out there that we can be thinking about? So to me, the fact that this is so much in the conversation now is an encouraging sign. And, and I think that, you know, we have a long ways to go, um, but the fact that we're all sitting here talking about it, um, to me is, is a positive, is a positive step. So I'll leave it there for now and, and leave the rest of the discussion for, for the question period. Great, thank you. And Anne-Marie? So uh, thank you again for having organized this panel. I agree with everyone who so far has said uh, just having these types of panels is very important to raise the consciousness and the visibility of this issue. I have had the pleasure of uh, working in international arbitration uh, in many different functions. I feel very fortunate to uh, have worked as the ICC Secretary General, so in an institutional framework. I worked as counsel for several law firms. I've continued to work as arbitrator and now, of course, as a professor at Georgetown. Uh, so I guess my perspective on the role of women covers all of these uh, different areas. And I can say over my time, I have definitely seen an evolution. I think I'm closer to Gabrielle in saying, I remember the days when uh, I would be the only woman uh, and now things have definitely evolved. But I, maybe some of my students, they know the story. Back in my beginning days as a counsel, uh, I was traveling to a hearing in London with a very senior partner and we go through immigration and the uh, English immigration person asked uh, the senior partner, is she your secretary? And he fortunately responded, no, she's my colleague. Uh, but that was the attitude at the time. Why would I be traveling with this very important lawyer? Uh, so that was 25 some years ago. There has been an evolution. But coming up to more recent times, I was cleaning my house during the holidays. <laughs> and I came across something that just struck me that it would be appropriate for this morning. Uh, I spoke recently at a conference in Istanbul, uh, the International Conference on Settlement of Investment Disputes and Arbitration. And they gave me this lovely souvenir to take home from the conference. And when I looked at it, it says, to Anne-Marie Weitzel, with compliments for his contribution <laughs> <laughs> to the International Conference. And so, yes, there has been some evolution. <laughs> Work but this is my document, this is my um, evidence <laughs> that there's still quite a long way to go forward. Now, um, looking 
at uh, what my colleagues have said. Um, I think everyone's talking about appointing women as arbitrators, and that is extremely important, but I do worry when the discussion becomes so focused on only talking about appointing arbitrators. I think it's very important, when, it, when young people ask me, how do you get into arbitration, you don't start by being an arbitrator. <laughs> and so you need to, I think, gain experience in mm -hmm. other areas, especially as counsel. And I think that looking at the pledge, if you look at the way the pledge is drafted, it's only talking about appointments. And on the website, it's appointing women. Yes, and I, and I fully agree this is important, but we need to make the discussion broader. And it can't just be arbitration, it also has to be litigation. The New York State Bar Association uh, came out with a report just this summer on the role of women uh, in the courts, and 25% only of lead counsel in New York, in the state courts and the federal courts, uh, in commercial and criminal cases, it's only 25% of the lead counsel are women. And they said as the case became more complex, they looked at more multi-party cases, <coughs> that number even goes down. So we're not going to expect to see this big revolution in arbitration if we are not already doing something in the litigation field mm -hmm. where, again, the training for most people going into arbitration takes place. So I think, again, very important to talk about appointing women as arbitrators, but the discussion has to be much broader. And uh, Anne-Marie, there is a second bullet point now. And okay. <laughs> promote the fair representation yes. of women in arbitration. Yes, but not in the general. website. We need to work website. on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we need to fix the website. The search engine for yeah. appointing women as arbitrators. What yeah. about women in other yeah, parts? No, I, I agree with you because I think that was part of uh, you know the discussion. Mm -hmm. Again, it, it's important to be critical yes. as well you know, as in we order to about. improve. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a wonderful <coughs> initiative, uh, but uh, so what comes back to for me, and this won't surprise you being a professor at Georgetown, is that I do believe it's a question of education mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, events like this, uh, initiatives like the pledge, these are very important uh, because the education is where it's all really going to change. And so if I look at our student body today uh, in our international LLM program, 52 to 54 percent of the students are women. Uh, that is very different from when I was in law school where it was two-thirds male compared to one-third women. So the, the evolution is taking place, but as you can see, there's still a lot more that mm -hmm. we need to do. Mm -hmm. So thank you again for having invited me to be here this morning. Thank you, Emory. And I appreciate that you come from multiple perspectives and that many of our panelists also have been, have held a diversity of roles within international arbitration. So we're happy to have those different perspectives. Um, I, I'm going to start by asking um, if there are, in addition to what you've talked about so far today, if any of the panelists can provide specific steps that can be taken to promote women as counsel, as arbitrators, and as experts in investor states and international commercial arbitrations. And I'll actually make it a multi-part question um, by asking both about more senior attorneys and then also if there's anything that, can, that lower level associates can do um, to help with gender parity in arbitration. Is there anyone who would like to tackle that first? We won't, we won't initiate Gonzalo by calling on him. <laughs> no, I can first. I'm happy to start. I'm happy to, okay. happy to start, no Go problem. Ahead. The faster I get out of here, <laughs> <laughs> the safer I am. Well, in, and as Claudio said, uh, now I'm officially the representative of the pledge in DC, apparently. And these are these are important initiatives, but uh, actions actions matter. Uh, and and I'm volunteering a response to a question that has not been made. That is why ICSID has not signed the pledge. There's a number of reasons uh, in terms of international organization and a larger mandate, and as Gabriel mentioned before, a larger concept of diversity that and certain particular requirements that we need to we need to fulfill. But I think that actions, the actions of the center, are the best evidence of where we stand. Uh, I didn't mention before that 75% uh, of the staff in each city is female. It wasn't like that when I first joined. We were 
not only, um, my wife would point out, not only 75% female, the head is a female. The, uh, the, the fair representation is at all level, at management level, at leadership level, at council level, at support level. It's not just 75% uh, of support, the secretary example that Anne-Marie mentioned. Yeah. Um, so what can be done? Anne-Marie mentioned the fact of you don't start as, a, as an arbitrator. I meet with students all the time, and they always tell me this thing about, oh, it has always been my dream to do investment arbitration. And I think that's so sad. I wanted to be a jazz musician. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a sad dream. But where you start is from the bottom. Be a good lawyer. Be a good counsel. And that's where we need to see more female. And we're seeing that. Uh, when I started doing this, there were very few lead counsel. There were, there were few arbitrators or non-arbitrators. But you, you had in those days, I remember, Lucy Reed, Caroline Lamb, Lucinda Lowe, Judith Gill leading the, this pack. Now you see a lot of heads of international law practices in big law firms, managing partners everywhere. So, so this is moving forward. Do we need quotas? That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, and, and, and I think like everybody else, I'm uncomfortable with any kind of quota. But, uh, I don't know if it works, but what it is true, and it was also mentioned, and for us has worked very well, states have a, an important power. If states make appointments under, under the convention, a state appoint judges, a state do a lot of things, and a state have diversity policies, and they, have Im they can implement that. Uh, transversal comment here has been that uh, the individual clients that, I thought it was fantastic. I have no female clients, no female expert. Never thought about it. Yeah, there are no financial female experts. I have never seen one, but I'm sure there are. But I, I haven't seen. Well, I don't go to hearings anymore. I'm not invited. <laughs> but uh, but one point that I want to make, in, in just to remark, and it's very sad. In an annual report last last year, we noted that uh, only 15% of uh, appointments uh, were were female. Out of that. Uh, if it, of that universe, 87% was appointed by ICSID and the states, 13% was appointed by jointly by the parties, 0% female <coughs> appointments last year by claimants, investors. Zero, no appointments. It's more than appointments, but, uh, but I think States, institutions, we're doing things. I don't know specific measures. We're taking some specific measures. You said symbols are important. I think symbols are important to push this forward. Um, I think we've done our part, or we keep doing our part. It's not enough, but we, we're trying hard. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to take your question from two perspectives. From the perspective as counsel, you know, I mean, leading with, uh, uh, dealing with uh, clients, uh, you know, and, uh, and from the perspective as a, uh, as a adjunct law professor. Uh, so uh, as counsel, um, yes, uh, uh, it is not that easy. And it's not that easy because, of course, we are in a milieu that is extremely international. You have to deal with clients that come from different backgrounds, I mean, not only legal backgrounds, but culturally backgrounds, you know, that they are different, uh, traditions that they are different, uh, and of course, it's not always that easy. Uh, but once you have the awareness going on, and that's why I think uh, doing this kind of, you know, conferences, pledge, other initiatives, they help, is because uh, uh, that put you uh, in a position to try to, uh, at least to try to make it happen. You know, at least to explain to your client why do you have to consider why you as client, we think that the best arbitrator, you know, is going to be this lady, this female uh, professional. Uh, not because she is a woman, but because she really has the qualifications. So as counsel, uh, you know, you have to take into that battle because if you don't take that battle, then uh, you know we're not doing what we are supposed to be doing. Uh, so I have different clients that they come back and say, no, 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 but she doesn't have a lot of experience. You know, show me how many cases she has been handling. And of course, it's when we have to reply, you know, and we have to say, well, precisely because nobody has given her the opportunity, this lady doesn't have 
cases, you know, on her back to show you, you know, but she has terrific works uh, that she has done, you know, she has been up here as an expert, you know, in such and such uh, court, you know, she has done this other work as counsel, and that's the kind of work that, in my opinion, needs to be done when we are counsel, you know, that's our responsibility. The same as uh, Gabrielle mentioned something very important to me, because I am very uncomfortable with quotas. I mean, after all, I'm Mexican, you know. So, <laughs> but, but, but she said something that is extremely important, and maybe this is the twist, you know, and the twist is, yeah, okay, let's not have a woman uh, uh, in a panel just because we want, we need a woman, uh, but at least it will make us to, um, to try to find for that woman. And this is in connection with my role as uh, in the academia. You know, now when we put together uh, you know, panels, seminars, discussions, uh, you know, so at least we make the effort. There must be someone out there who knows about this topic, let's consider that person. And if that person happens to be a woman, even better, you know? So, but, uh, but that's the process that I think where uh, probably as, most of, as much as we hate quotas, uh, you know, maybe we need to revisit them in the sense of at least that will put us in a position where we have to try to find other people because otherwise the work is really too comfortable. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And I'm particularly interested in this idea that you brought up of the client or the user impacting who gets appointed and who has the representations. Gabrielle, do you have any thoughts on how you can influence <laughs> the clients? <laughs> 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 I'm going to the worst person to answer this because I generally come in when, when, a, when the appointments are made. Uh, and so I don't even know how they appoint me. But, okay. but, but, <laughs> but so, uh, so no, I cannot answer this. I, I, I may be able to answer a few other things. Uh, education, of course, education is the key, is mm -hmm. a must. We, I don't even need to discuss this. But then, I mean, we have had uh, lost uh, a majority of, of uh, women as law students, at least in Europe, for quite a while. 15 years, maybe. If you then look at, they, they move <coughs> on, right? They go to law firms, and then you look at the percentage of senior associates or, se or, or junior partners. Mm -hmm. by, by that time, they should at least be junior partners, and then the percentage drops, drops. dramatically. So something happens there, uh, <coughs> and uh, what is it? It's not a matter of education, because they, they're perfectly uh, well uh, educated and capable. So uh, there, there's, a, uh, there's a, an issue of facilitating work for young women with small children in law firms. I don't know what law firms do, and I'm not qualified to speak about it, but I'm sure more can be done. And I, I have three children when they were all young. I worked at night, I worked at home, I worked over weekend, but I had a lot of flexibility. I could do uh, whatever I wanted except for trips, right? But, uh, but that was manageable and I would simply travel much less than what I have done later. But these are very practical things that also need to be discussed because if uh, women cannot, uh, or if, it does, if you have to be a super woman to, uh, to uh, get to a certain level, then some may and others may just not want to do it, and why would we require it from them? That men don't have to do this. Uh, to succeed. So that is something that uh, needs to be discussed as well. That's more uh, a, a law firm policy. There's, there's, a, there's a discrimination uh, that nobody speaks about, that's age discrimination. Uh -huh. uh, especially <coughs> if you look at the uh, pool of uh, investment arbitrators, they're, they're very old. <laughs> I mean, they're not only male, but they're also old. And uh, don't say this to my colleagues, right? <laughs> I'm getting old too, actually. And so, um, so um, I've never, uh, sometimes I work with younger arbitrators. I've never seen a, a young arbitrator who doesn't do a good job. Quite the contrary, and that's something that, that lawyers can tell their clients when they make up their lists. Mm -hmm. they they have to prove something, mm -hmm. so they work very hard on the case to show that they're capable. 
I cannot say this of all the older gentlemen with whom I work. So, uh, so because they have nothing more to mm -hmm. prove and they have many cases. And so uh, this age thing uh, may also help uh, women uh, getting a better share uh, for in all the different uh, activities. So, and, and the same applies actually to experiences. It's age and experience, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, th there's many other things that can be done, like uh, we have spoken of diverse candidate list for appointments, clients to require diverse uh, candidates list, uh, law, uh, law firms to staff, uh, uh, diverse teams in arbitrations, conference organizers, uh, not to organize conferences without uh, women speakers, uh, speak invited speakers, not to accept to speak. I could not have come here without consent <laughs> <laughs> on this panel, right? It works both ways. So, uh, so these are these are smaller things, and, and as we move on, they will become habits. But uh, but I'm not sure this uh, will be sufficient to move on. Great, thank you for those points. And uh, I especially appreciate the, the thought about retention. And so I'd love to think more about that as we go along, but I will try again on the, on the question about the <laughs> client and user. And perhaps, Tara, you could also share your thoughts on quotas. Sure. So um, um, I don't know whether I will be able to share my thoughts on quotas, because I, I feel like I have to think about it <laughs> okay, some more. I think um, my thoughts on it are a little too unsettled. But uh, on the, the user point, um, I mean, I think from the perspective of users in terms of claimants, especially sort of companies, I mean, I think one thing that's really important is seeing women not just in kind of counsel and outside counsel and in firms, but women in general counsel's offices and in in those kind of client companies. Um, I think that that is something that has to be in parallel um, with any efforts that are being made in the sort of specifically in the arbitration world. Um, I think if you have a client company that doesn't have women in leadership positions, doesn't have women in the general counsel's office, and isn't generally sort of thinking about these issues, then, you know, counsel can play a role in sort of raising it and educating them, but there's only so far I think that that can go um, if you don't have the sort of twin move um, on, the, on the client side to have women represented there. On the state side, you know, one thing that I've been, I've been sort of thinking about ways that women, especially younger women, um, you know, I'm only eight years into my career, I'm fairly really junior still, um, you know, younger women can do in terms of professional development in this field. And a couple things that have occurred to me just watching, you know, on both on both the claimant and the respondent side as appointments are made are, you know, this is, arbitration is still in many ways a small world. I think, you know, reputation matters, being kind of a known quantity in some sense matters. So I think the extent to which, in terms of appointments, women can get experience, not necessarily being, you know, appointed in some kind of big, very public investment arbitration, but just smaller disputes that have lists or panels um, on a much smaller scale that may seem less exciting as disputes, but that give women that kind of experience of having sat on a panel. Um, you know, I know that when you look at who you might consider appointing, you say, well, what's their experience? You know, if all their experience is counsel, that's great, but you wanna know that someone has maybe had at least some experience sitting in a deliberations room. And so even if that's been on a much smaller scale, I think that's helpful. But the other bigger thing, um, which I struggle with myself sometimes, is um, putting yourself sort of out there, um, sitting on panels, writing articles, kind of being present in the arbitration world from the time that you're a fairly junior associate. Because, you know, I multiple times I've had colleagues come back from a conference or a panel or whatever and say, you know, how, do you know so-and-so? Like, she, you know, she spoke on this panel and, you know, she had some interesting things to say. We should consider her the next time that we have, that we're thinking about this appointment or like, you know, wh what, do you, what do you know about her? And so I think that there's, that is something that I think a lot of women maybe struggle with and I'm, I'm hugely overgeneralizing here, but I think a lot of times we're, we have some kind of natural tendency that's been taught to us to sort of not put yourself out there too much. Like that's, that's there's something a little bit icky about that. Um, but um, men are much, uh, much better at doing it than we are sometimes. So I think that is one thing, I think just from an early point in, in your career of women really being present um, 
and meeting people and writing and thinking and talking um, so that they are they aren't just sort of a name on the page that you don't recognize you can sort of put that name to some kind of thinking that's that's out there in the world so those are those are a couple things that I would say is just getting experience early on if you want appointments later but also just um, being kind of active in the field so that your your name is elevated great um, that makes a lot of sense. Anne Marie, can you add anything on women putting themselves out there more or, or self promotion? Um, and then anything you, you started to talk a little bit about um, the different roles that you have taken on. So I was wondering if there's anything you've seen in particular as you transitioned from one role to another um, beyond what you said about the, the makeup of law schools. Um, and um, both of you have seen that in terms of women in arbitration, um, but also arbitration in general thoughts from, from different perspectives. Well, I'd, I'd like to come back and speak a little bit about the idea of um, putting women on lists, uh, because I do think that this is a positive step, of course, to make people think about different people that they could consider when they're appointing. But I think we, again, have to be very careful, uh, because this is sometimes just a way of window dressing. And to say that there are these women on these lists, it's great to be on a list, but you never get the appointment, right? Because the list will have the men, and the people will still look at the women and say, that's very nice, and appoint the men. So it, it's, again, a great initiative, and everything uh, is going in the right direction. But it has to be more than just putting women's names on lists. Uh, and I can tell you, my name gets put on lots of lists uh, because I can be the token woman. Uh, it happens through the institutions. I'm on the list of arbitral institutions. I'm sure for Gabriel, it's the same. Uh, institutions you don't even know exist because they need, <laughs> maybe they have quotas because they want to say, and we have these women on our list. But it doesn't mean they're really going to think about appointing those women. So we can't just sit back and, and accept that being on a list is going to mean being appointed. Uh, and I think there, my own personal experience again also is that women uh, as counsel, they can play a very important role in appointing women. And it's happened to me on several occasions where the, the women counsel will want to appoint a female arbitrator. And I had a string of them where they were women that were uh, coming to me. So uh, women do have to also help each other. Uh, I think in this system because the men are not necessarily going to think about appointing the woman. Do you have thoughts on quotas or aspirational targets? I, I honestly uh, don't like the idea of quotas either. I believe the best thing women can do is be good at what they're doing and it is a field where the reputation is extremely important and if you do a good job it does get known uh, and I think there, the stress should be on, again, training, education, uh, experience, so that the, the women, we end up with people like Gabrielle as kind of role models also uh, for women. It's not going to be just because we say we need this percentage that we're going to get the right people. So I, I want to open it up to the audience. I'm going to ask one question first, um, which just goes back to the discussion about the pledge. And I was wondering, Claudia, if you could speak to whether you have seen real changes since the pledge was initiated. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I mean, just taking my own personal example, I think it, uh, to me, yes, because um, uh, you know, now that I am more aware about the initiative, that I know where the initiative is going, we have to correct the website, you know, to make Anne Marie happy. But <laughs> having said that, uh, um, I think it has because precisely what Gabrielle was saying. So now I'm more um, aware of the issue. I think. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more about it. Not that I wasn't before, I don't think, but now I have it more present, you know, like, oh yeah, so uh, we're going to discuss about, I don't know, expropriation in this panel discussion at school. Uh, so who is an expert on this field? Of course, names immediately come to my mind. And then I will stop and say, is there any female lawyer that has published recently an article or has done some research on the topic? You know, let, let's look for it. You know, so uh, at that level, I think it's a good, it's a good, uh, it's a good change. Another good change is, uh, you know, I, I teach. Uh, I love to be, uh, you know, and meet with my students, uh, males, females. Uh, but uh, now I'm particularly more sensitive to also 
uh, stop until, you know, the female students, uh, uh, maybe a little bit of an extra tip, you know, and uh, the extra tip will be the attitude, you know. I mean, it is a fact. We, we're very different from uh, guys, uh, thank God. And uh, um, I'm teasing you. Uh, so, but uh, no, but the idea is that uh, in a way, and Marie was saying it, uh, you know, I mean, they react, they, they just have another personality. It's easier, you know. I mean, I just ask anybody. It happens to me at the law firm all the time, you know. I am talking to one of my partners, male partners, and then I said something, and then he said, oh, let me call my friend, and of course, a guy, you know, and then you can talk to him. Uh, you know, I, and I stop now and I say, okay, how many times if someone asks me the same question, I will say, let's call my friend such and such female friend. You know what I mean? Uh, so it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a lot of in that respect and I think uh, it does make a change because you just stop, smell the roses and then go ahead. Mm -hmm. think about it. Yeah, that makes sense. That's great. Um, I would like to open the questions up to the audience. And I think that we are going to have someone take around a microphone. So are the volunteers ready? <laughs> Great. And Nicholas, um, you can take the microphone back, but I would like you as, a, as our uh, representative <laughs> from Georgetown's International Arbitration Society to also start with the first question. OK, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now that I'm here. Hey. Well, no, thank you very much for, for everything. It has been a wonderful discussion. My question will be a general one, anyone that wants to jump in. Do you think the challenges that women are facing right now are more on the institutional level, law firms, arbitration institutions, maybe in the government itself, or maybe more in the field level? Is it just a challenge or a problem for international arbitration itself, different from other fields in the law? Or is it more a perception level, more in the, in the society, uh, in, the, in the companies, or like the client's world? Any comments? And we'll maybe take two or three questions before we um, go ahead and have the panelists ask. So I see one over here. Thanks, uh, Marcia Wiss. Um, I was thinking about the issue of um, sponsorship versus mentorship that we so frequently talk about um, in the context of the fact that about a year and a half ago, I was asked to be an expert witness in an international arbitration matter, not in, um, not, uh, not in arbitration, but in federal district court. And I was thinking about the process. How did it happen? And the selector was a woman partner in a well-known <coughs> firm. Um, but the person who caused it to happen was my co-professor in international investment law at SICE. And he sponsored me. She said, who do you know who's good? And he is married to a woman who uh, is a lawyer who's very prominent. And he said, Marcia Wiss. And so I think a lot of it is mm -hmm. the society, it's the people who are making decisions, it's coming up from the bottom at what is the point where that decision is made? Who's making it and who's advising? Mm -hmm. yep. And there was also a question right behind you. Hello, I'm Juliana Canet. Uh, so we heard that maybe from an arbitrator perspective, the dynamic is not yet, we don't know if it's changing or not, the presence of a woman and we don't have statistics. What about your perspective, Gonzalo, about the dynamics of the panel when there is a woman or even from the government institution? Do you see a change in the deliberation dynamics and in the outcome or not yet clear? I would, but it's going to look really horrible, so go ahead. 
I uh, can I just fun. take uh, yeah can I just take the question about uh, or comment comment and uh, thank you mentor uh, mentor as opposed to sponsor uh, I agree with you and I now that I have been uh, you know in the private sector for uh, almost nine years now uh, yeah, I know uh, so it is uh, it is uh, it's a big difference it's a big difference especially being uh, a private lawyer. Uh, if you really get to that uh, sponsor inside your your own firm, uh, it, I really think the rest is history, because uh, because that's and that, that can be a male sponsor or a female sponsor, uh, but that person becomes more than your mentor. It really becomes the person who thinks about you as someone who can do the job, and uh, and it really push you and challenge yourself. So that's a work that I think is uh, not necessarily well addressed uh, uh, in, uh, in law firms. Uh, uh, at least now I can I think I can say that uh, although it happens it happens but I think we're not totally aware of it uh, and I think work needs to be done uh, in, uh, in, in that respect um, the, because that's an excellent way to uh, to also push for this kind of initiatives to really, uh, you know, to really help uh, uh, development, professional development of young uh, female lawyers. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Great. And uh, Gonzalo, would you like to answer the question? <laughs> the of the panel? I, I said at the beginning, totally unfounded and excessive confidence on my qualifications. Um, on Juliana's question, uh, and, and it would be interesting to. We can have a coffee later and you tell me your experience. <laughs> For those who don't know, uh, Juliana is the uh, Secretary General, Executive Secretary of the Admin Tribunal at the IDB and a former colleague of mine and a dear friend. So uh, the impact on diver of diversity on the dynamics and quality or whatever contents of a decision, I think it's a very interesting question and Gabriel mentioned it before. There is no scientific evidence, of course. Uh, my wife also referred to a number of, of papers and research on this topic that a uh, more diverse uh, decision body makes better or broader. I don't know what I, I don't know the I don't know the answer. Of of course the dynamics are different, but so are if the the decision makers are from different geographical backgrounds, regional backgrounds, religious backgrounds. There's a number of other elements to go into this. What I was thinking um, the last few days, uh, I have not, and it's probably my fault, and you mentioned it, I have never been in a tribunal with two females and, and a male. It has always, the dynamics has been only males or one female, maybe. I ha I've been on many with yeah, right. I, I, yeah. I've never been one with all females. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the ICC has had yeah. cases with three female arbitrators. Yeah. Of course, we have less cases, so it's, uh, my experience is more limited, but, uh, but I, I don't have any scientific background to say anything, but I, I, there has to be a, a well, difference. Maybe now that you mentioned my idea, recently it's composed by seven judges, and recently we have five ladies and two men, uh, plus me as a secondary woman, but I don't play an active role, but I'm there, you know, to facilitate. And the dynamic, I see already a change uh, in terms of uh, ladies try to get the majority of the, I don't know, the opinion or the majority of vote. They try to compromise. So I see the dynamics. I don't know if this is good or bad. Clearly, the culture, background play a role. But I see already a more conciliatory kind of, uh, less assertive. But maybe it's just the personality that I have. Right? I I see men who can be very conciliatory and others who never look for consensus. So, and I also see female who can be very aggressive in deliberation. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it's, uh, but it's interesting that you say yeah. this and that you observe that, yeah. Maybe yeah. it's more, you know, seven members, they need to kind of agree more, it's not mm -hmm. a dynamic of three, but this is my perception, having a recent shift doesn't mean that it's, could be a trend, I don't know. Mm -hmm. There's this theory of the good number yeah, for exactly. making decisions, and three is not one. Yeah. Uh, five <laughs> is good and seven is good. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that may create a different role, group yeah. dynamics as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I've never had that dynamics with soul arbitrators. <laughs> 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 um, I'll just weigh in on, I don't know, I didn't want to interrupt you, are you? No, no, no. You're good? Okay. I, I wanted to just mention two quick things. I mean, first on the, the mentorship versus sponsorship point. I mean, I, I really come to realize how important both of them are. Um, I will put in a very quick plug for Willig's uh, mentorship program. I've just become a mentor this year and it's been really fantastic so far. I know one of my mentees at least is in the room, so say nice things about me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think the mentorship part is, is really important. But in terms of sponsorship, I mean, the reason I'm sitting here is that a very, very dear friend and former colleague of mine, I think Tracy had approached and she said, I can't make it. Why don't you ask Tara? Um, so, you know, I think both, both play a really important role. I think if we stop at mentorship and never sponsor and say, um, you know, you should consider this person for this particular role. Um, that's kind of, that's certainly problematic, but I think mentorship is also just having someone you can sort of talk these things through with, who's maybe, you know, at least a few years sort of ahead of you in terms of their career development is, is incredibly helpful. Um, on the, the question about women being present and, and kind of the, the quality of deliberations. I mean, I have, I've never sat as an arbitrator, so I, I don't have a perspective on how this works in arbitral deliberations, but just in terms of having women in the workplace, um, I, th I think part of the problem that we have with this is, is maybe everyone has some sort of instinctive sense that if you have a diverse group, obviously you're going to have more viewpoints that are going to feed into the decision-making process, but I think it's incredibly hard, at least for me, to think about how do you quantify that? I mean, how do you how do you construct kind of a, a way of measuring what that means to the decision-making process? I mean, I certainly have a sense that it does matter to walk into a room and have, you know, a half and half kind of women and men, but also, you know, other, other forms of diversity as well. That does make a difference to the discussion, but I don't really know how you would measure that in terms of outcomes or things that could have been considered but weren't, or it, I just don't have a, a good sense of how one turns that into like a statistical question. Um, but neither do I think that we're wrong in our instinctive sense that it does matter for the, the quality of decisions. Mm -hmm. Great, and let's go ahead and take a few more questions. Uh, but I think nobody answered his question. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's true, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so we want equality could you here. Could speak a little bit about um, the question about comparing this field and other fields and then the areas as well where um, where this is an issue. Do you want me to? Do you want to, do you want to take I mean, the question for a moment? <laughs> I, no, I think, uh, I mean, I don't know what my colleagues uh, here think, but, mm -hmm. but I think it's a general issue, you know. I, I don't really think that it's necessarily specifically with, uh, to arbitration. It just happens that I think uh, uh, the ladies in the international com uh, uh, arbitration community start getting more organized, probably. Uh, you know, and now we're seeing all these changes, initiatives, th uh, uh, panel discussions, and all that. Uh, but I think it's an issue in general, and um, and, and and I think uh, we're uh, we are the facing the issue here in our own particular field. Uh, I'm sure that other, uh, you know, uh, female professionals in no different fields, they're facing the same, uh, the same issues uh, in law firms, you know, uh, uh, I, think, uh, I, think, I think it's a fact. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure about mm -hmm. that. Uh, the, the problem is a reflection of society, mm -hmm. certainly. That's one thing. Uh, but uh, I think this uh, this field is, is rather conservative. There are more conservative <coughs> ones. Look at the financial sector, for instance. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very male dominated. Um, but if you look at, uh, at least in Europe, you look at courts, you look, at, I mean, national courts, you look at politics, you look at academia, it's much more better, balanced than international arbitration. Or so other fields of law, human or rights law. Mm -hmm. Human rights yeah. law, for instance, is also, is, uh, is uh, not to speak of family law and, uh, and the, the type of, but, uh, but so, uh, but we I think have, a lot. We I have more work to yeah, do. Yeah, we than have more work to do. Yes, yeah. and also, I mean, one question, uh, one point that everybody was debating, and uh, it's also cultural. You know, I mean, it all depends on yes. your own uh, background. You know, and uh, I, I definitely, I can tell you, I definitely go back to Mexico, and uh, and I and I see the big difference between practicing law, honestly, in Mexico and practicing law in the U.S. 
I think as, a, the, as a female professional. Right, the, the international nature of what we're doing, yes. it's very hard to generalize and say mm -hmm. it's like this for women in international arbitration mm -hmm. because there are such cultural differences around the world. Uh, but surprisingly, from my own experience, in the places where you would think it was worse for women, actually the experience can be the, the best. And in places such as here in the US, where you think women are so advanced and have so many rights, often the situation is the worst. And thanks for keeping me honest, Claudia. We will, <laughs> we will continue with a few more questions. I saw that there was one over here. Hi, Jennifer Hillman from Georgetown Law. I, I have a question that's sort of more systemic in thinking about it, and this may come a little bit from my background in, in more on the trade side. Um, I served as a member of the WTO appellate body, and certainly when I was there, the notion that you could serve as an appellate body member and also serve as counsel in any way or an advocate in any way in any trade case was simply not on. I mean, you could not do that. And I'm curious about the tension that I see, at least, between sort of one of the points Gabrielle made about the importance of legitimacy um, in and around arbitrations um, and the sort of growing concern that you cannot actually serve as, an, as a, a fair and objective and legitimate arbitrator um, today and yet tomorrow show up as an absolute advocate for a particular p position um, with Anne Marie's point that you can't just start out by being appointed an arbitrator. So I'm just curious sort of if it is true that we need to be concerned about not having all of our arbitrators be drawn from pools of existing counsel, existing advocates, how then do women get um, the experience that they really need um, and have to have to show um, to then be appointed as arbitrators if they can't at the same time be sitting counsel? And any other questions? Do we have any in the, towards the back that I'm missing? Uh, hi, Natalia Schlatt. I have a question. Um, so last month we showed or uncovered that there's a lot of challenges that women face in different industries uh, with inappropriate behavior of men. And I was wondering whether, um, what is your opinion or views on the similar challenges that women possibly face in the international arbitration industry? And um, what could be maybe a platform to uh, address those concerns? Thank you. Maybe I start with the question of double hatting. Uh, it seems to me, uh, but this is not a general view, that at least as an investment arbitrator, you cannot be counsel at the same time in investment cases, and that's a matter of legitimacy uh, and perception for the outside world. The same does not hold true in, in commercial arbitration. Uh, now, the only a uh, real objection to this that uh, bothers me and I don't know what to do about it is, is the one that you have raised, is how then do we get uh, younger, it's not a female, it's just younger yeah. people mm -hmm. who are counsel uh, uh, appointed in investment arbitrations and then tell them, well now you have one uh, appointment as, as, as arbitrator, so now you stop all your counsel work. It's just <laughs> economically not feasible. And that, that, is, that is a difficult question, and I don't know the answer to it, but it's, it's the good question. <laughs> well, we've clearly seen uh, the effect as we watch the lawyers who did get experience as counsel move in, move out of the big law firms, move into the boutique firms, and, mm -hmm. and then concentrate solely on doing arbitration. But I, I agree completely with Gabrielle that we have to make a distinction between investment arbitration and commercial arbitration. Because on the commercial side, honestly, the people who have counsel experience are often the best arbitrators and mm -hmm. vice versa. The, the two go together very well. Gonzalo, do you want to share um, any thoughts on either of those questions? Not really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess I must. Um, yeah, it is, it is the, the double head heading. It's a question. It's a hot question. It's a uh, prominent question. 
in, in our field um, and how do you build experience and you're independent at the same time. It is, it is a conundrum, and we acknowledge that. Um, I think one, one of the ways, first, there, I think there's two points that are important, and I don't, like Gabriel, I don't have an answer to that, but I think the two things that are important is numbers. I think numbers are important because we tend to say that everybody is double hatting. Mm -hmm. You're double hatting, you're double hatting, you're double hatting. No, it's not the case. Uh, the numbers are smaller than, than it sounds. It's a serious problem, which makes it superlative, but it's, it's, it's smaller numbers that I think that it, that it really is. And also the matter of different universes. Uh, I really correctly said commercial arbitration, investment arbitration. <coughs> investment arbitration is a very small field. And it's not small because we keep it close to ourselves. It's by nature a smaller field, very defined disputes. Uh, commercial arbitration is a very good place to start developing your jobs, your experience, to uh, to learn how to be a good arbitrator. And and we're living in a very different world than 20 years ago, but I remember 20 years ago, somebody would say, hey, I suggest so-and-so as a presiding arbitrator. That has never done investment arbitration. Yeah, but it's a good lawyer, and it's a good mm -hmm. judge, and he has good experience on this and that. Okay, and they became excellent investment arbitrators. Uh, again, as we have said, Couple of, and Marie mentioned it, I, have, I say it all the time to students, before wanting to be an arbitrator, be a good lawyer. Um, <laughs> practice, learn to be a good lawyer on any, any field. Same, not everybody needs to be an investment arbitrator. Again, there's a limited number of, of, of appointments and cases. But there's a lot, as my friend Horacio Grijera announces all the time, you're just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much commercial arbitration out there where you, have, you can train exactly the same skills that you need and you will transpose to an investment arbitration. A good lawyer with good arbit commercial arbitration skills will make a good investment arbitrator. Claudia, can you um, take on the question about behavior and, and harassment? Yeah, I knew that you would be asking. That was my own, <laughs> and I'm guilty for my own. Um, uh, well. Uh, I don't know I was thinking about your question. Uh, I, I really don't uh, um, necessarily have an answer to that, to be honest. Uh, I do know that, uh, uh, you know, the past couple months there was a lot of discussion, you know, especially in Ojumid, uh, you know, <coughs> about uh, misbehavior, inappropriate uh, behavior, you know, uh, from male or, or even female, you know, uh, uh, you know, against uh, subordinates, if, if I may say it that way. Uh, so, and uh, I, I don't, unfortunately, I don't think that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a concrete um, a strategy out there to try to fight that. I do know that in Ojumid, actually, they announced that there is a new platform, uh, you know, created by one of the moderators uh, in Ojumid. Uh, I don't recall now the name of the new platform, but it precisely it was to address more uh, uh, controversial kind of issues like this one. Uh, you know, with the idea to have a forum where we can discuss uh, this kind of problems. Uh, but I am, uh, to really be honest with you, I'm very fortunate because I have never been, I, I had never experienced that in my whole career. Uh, you know, I do, of course, feel for uh, any colleague who had to go through that. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a very serious topic and we need to, we need to think about it mm -hmm. and react to it. Mm -hmm. and, and Ray, do you have anything to add on either of those questions? I'm hoping that the women today have more confidence in themselves and are mm -hmm. not going to put up with what perhaps women put up with in the past, or at least will speak out about it. So yeah. I, I try to believe there's been a positive evolution on that level, and, and women are just stronger standing mm -hmm. up for themselves, hopefully. And, and I don't think it's an arbitration problem. Mm -hmm. it's just, that's a societal problem. Great, and I just asked the panelists as we wrap up if anyone has any, any final comments or anything they've noticed as they've switched from different roles. So being a professor versus an arbitrator or a state representative versus a um, private sector council. Um, any final thoughts? And I'll ask Tara and Gabrielle, um, since we haven't heard from you in these last uh, couple minutes, if there's anything you'd like to share. Um, sure. So, 
you know, as I said, for me, I guess the switch has been kind of private sector to public sector and, and primarily claimant side to primarily respondent side in, in terms of um, investor state work. I mean, I guess, I guess the, the perspective shift that I've seen is just looking at arbitration, the world of arbitration, not so much case to case as, as a whole system um, and as a, as a system that has various different kind of constituencies that I think I didn't consider so much when I was in private practice. I think there was more of a sense of, uh, you know, you had a sense of your own reputation and your own kind of interest in preserving the field that you loved to work in. But I think there's more of a sense of, you know, what's the case I'm working on? You know, who's the client? What's the sort of strategy? What are the legal arguments? Who's my panel of arbitrators? Whereas I think the view from government, and part of this is because certainly in the US, but I think in other countries, we have a very robust interagency process. So it's not just my office, but other offices that you know are discussing and all have to kind of somehow end up on the same page in terms of our positions on some of these questions. Um, is really kind of looking at arbitration as a whole system and kind of taking a step back from it. And part of that is also just in terms of constituencies. You know, now I have to kind of think about, well, you know, what was the recent New York Times case, like piece about this? What's the press saying? What's, are we gonna get letters from Congress about this? Because part of our job is often responding to letters from members of Congress. You know, what are NGOs kind of thinking about this? What's the business community thinking? What are the bar associations saying? Um, so for me, I think it's just, I think it's been really useful to kind of take that step out of the kind of day-to-day -day of litigation and just look at the system as a whole and think, well, what works, what doesn't, you know, what are people upset about that like is really overblown and what are people upset about that, you know, kind of makes sense to be upset about. And I think that's something that, that is maybe useful for, for everyone in the field to do more often is just to take that step back and look at, look at everything from a multitude of perspectives rather than just the individual cases. Gabrielle, any final comments? No final comment. That would be overwhelming. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think Tara said it all. I, I usually try to look at arbitration from a systemic point of view more than from one given perspective than another. I have been counsel. I'm an arbitrator. I'm a professor. I've been sitting on arbitral institutions, so I'm trying to have a, mm -hmm. a general view because I think that is what is helpful and uh, what you've just said uh, summarizes this well. And I'm sure everybody wants to go to work in that. <laughs> <laughs> but please, when you go to work, uh, remember what we have been discussing. <laughs> Today, there's lots of things that uh, need to be worked on uh, as we move along. Great, and one last comment from Anne-Marie. So speaking now as the law professor, though, I think we can all still be very optimistic. And we, of course, we all realize there's a lot of work left to do. But when I look at the students at my law school and I watch uh, the way they are able to cooperate with each other, the way they do the now the moot uh, arbitration events, the, the men and women are mixed, are, oh. are respecting the work of each other. The, they're, things are going in the right direction. And I do, again, come back to education. Uh -huh. I believe the next generation, looking at the YAF groups, et cetera, it's all very, very positive. Uh -huh. So uh, more events like this, but it, it's, it's happening, and education is the key. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists. We are very